And so as leaders, as coaches, I think we have to go help our leadership teams really figure that out and, and really start to have those conversations. And that for me is the foundation of everything we do in the human system, is making sure that we're creating clarity of what's expected of me, asking those questions. Welcome to Tip Top, growing up your business with Metronomics. We'll be talking to business thought leaders, entrepreneurs, CEOs, and business team coaches who have all taken the journey to grow up their businesses to their tip top. We'll be sharing strategies, systems, and stories on how you can grow up your company at the speed you want. If you're searching for your path to the tip top and feel your time is running out, then this podcast is for you. I am your host, Jed Roberts. Today, I'm with John Ninkovich, who is a metronomics coach who is based out of Michigan in the US. Good morning, John. How are you? I'm great. Nice to be with you, Jed. How are you? Well, I'm looking forward. To I'm very good. I'm very good. I'm looking forward today. So today, John, we're going to be talking about the human system and the coach cascade system. Now, there's lots and lots of writing out there on the human system, but coach cascade system? Not so much. So I'm looking forward to getting your perspective on both of those and, and particularly your perspective on the Coach Cascade system. So but before we do dive right down into, into the, the nuts and bolts of those two of the, of the metronomic systems, tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, how did you get to where you are now? What, what's, what's your background? How did you get here? Uh, yeah, I grew up actually in family-owned businesses. Um, golly, started working in those businesses when I was... 10, 12 years old, um, been a part of uh, seeing multiple businesses that have been uh, bought, uh, started from scratch, um, uh, kind of put together and, you know, really grew up in that environment. So really grew up in a really entrepreneurial environment. I was lucky enough to be able to do that. Um, and, you know, over my professional career, I also had the opportunity to run um, three or four different companies in different industries. Again, those were either from startups or acquisitions or companies that I ran uh, while I had the opportunity to go in and, and uh, uh, take on a leadership role and then partnering those companies. So they have a really diverse background. Uh, got into coaching because I actually had a couple of coaches in my experience when uh, I realized that uh, I needed some help and some perspective from the outside. I didn't have all the answers that I uh, I really needed to have and I needed uh, I needed help. And, you know, one of the things that I found as a, a, a CEO or an owner of a company is that a lot of times it's really lonely at the top. Um, and I needed somebody that really, uh, had my back, um, could challenge me when I needed to be challenged, uh, pat me on the back when I needed encouragement, uh, somebody that, that could be my, uh, kind of sounding board for the things that I was running into and running, uh, running businesses. And, um, uh, you know, did that and, and had a coach for, oh, golly, about 15 years professionally. And it was super impactful for me, both professionally and Quite maybe even more personally, um, and just made a huge difference. And so, um, you know, I've got a, a, a I think a, a, a really, um, I'm excited, or, or I, 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 I like the business background that I have. Uh, I love the coaching uh, background that I've been able to experience by working with somebody that mentored me. And you know, one of the reasons I became a coach was uh, my coach made a huge impact in me, and um, I wanted to go do the same thing. So I wanted to help you know, business leaders, entrepreneurs, business owners, uh, figure out where they're going to go with their companies and uh, be there to help them become a trusted advisor to them and their teams to help them achieve their, their goals and, and really um, create legacies. And so that's why um, I started doing this work about uh, seven and a half years ago, full time now. And you came straight into Metronomics. Metronomics was your, your first coaching organization. Is that right? Yeah, it wasn't. I, um, I actually started with a smaller group of coaches. There was eight or 10 of us that were using a methodology. It's pretty similar to EOS. And um, I kind of got my foundation built there. And um, one of the things I realized is that, you know, the companies that I was, uh, that I was dealing with, um, one of the things that they didn't have was really a strategy. You know, so what I find in small and mid-sized businesses is they don't really have a strategy or know how to, how to develop a strategy. And so... Um, I was working with a smaller group, um, and as I looked at what I thought my clients needed, uh, I became aware of Shannon Susco and what was happening with what was done, the, the three hag organization and some of the things that she was doing with, um, strategy. And I thought, wow, this is really cool. And I think these are great tools, um, that I can include in my, in my practice and, and, um, and really help my clients really figure out and who are the customers that they surely be working with and, um, why. 
and then build their strategy around that. And so um, I, I became part of the economics organization uh, about four and a half years ago. And um, it's been it's been a phenomenal uh, ride for me, you know, being able to meet people like yourself and the other coaches that we get a chance to work with and share their perspectives and knowledge and expertise. It's just been, um, it's been an unbelievable experience in, in the metronomics framework, the systems we put them together, our ability to work with clients using those systems, I just find to be um, just really beneficial to me as a coach and to my clients and really make an impact on their business. So yeah, I've been, I've been using the metronomics uh, methodology for about four or four and a half years now. For, for me, it's the strength of the community that is really, really powerful. It is. You know, there's some great people in the community, and it's it's difficult to see a bunch of coaches anywhere else that have the same the same depth of experience and and yeah, in, insight. I, I feel. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, you go to our events. You know, you you and I've been at a bunch of these events over the last three or four years together, and there's always something I learn. That's something. There's so much that I learn, and I've been doing this for a bit, and um, and I've had coaches in my professional career, and I. And I get a chance to sit around with our contemporaries and our peers and just like they're just doing some amazing work and what's really cool is we get to learn from them and be able to use that and bring it to our clients so for me it's like I'm a lifelong learner and and um, I just always want to get better at being a better coach and making a better impact on my clients and so our community is just super strong it's just great to be able to reach out to somebody and ask a question about something that you know, maybe I don't have all the answers on or I'm not uh, as strong in one area as another. And to have somebody that's got that deep expertise, it's just it's really powerful. Okay, so we try and cover off a different topic for each of these these podcasts. And the one we're going to cover off today is the human system and the Coach Cascade system. Uh, both of those systems are part of what we call the soft systems in metronomics. So they're the, they're the systems that relate to people. And paradoxically, it's the soft systems that are hard in business. Because we know how to do execution. We know how to formulate a strategy. You know, we know how to manage cash. Uh, but as soon as people get involved, everything gets that much harder. So, so John, why, why did you choose these topics? You know, it's funny. Um, so I grew up in these family businesses, and I, and I kind of started a podcast talking about that. And I was lucky enough to be business partners with my dad in a couple of different businesses. When I graduated from college, we ran a couple of businesses together. And um, we did pretty good with those. And, um, as, as I moved on my career, I was looking for additional opportunities. And my dad's like, you know, with the next business we get in, let's get into business. So don't have any employees. <laughs> I'm like, that's, that's almost impossible for us to be able to do that. And, and I thought, you know, I, I want to be able to, to use the employee side, the human side is a competitive advantage. If we can get really, really good at building our people strategies, which the human system is really built around that we can outcompete everybody. We may not have to have that much of a differentiation from a competitive perspective, but we can just get really, really good at getting the right people that fit our culture, that want to work cohesively together. I just think there's unbelievable power in that. And uh, so for me, I'm really passionate about it. And it goes back to my roots growing up in family-owned businesses when, you know, when I was a young kid, there was things I had to go in and, and uh, kind of bail out of our family organization because we didn't have the right people in place. And I, I, I just remember having these conversations with my dad as a young guy, I was 18 or 19. I'm like, why do we have these people doing these things? He's like, well, they've been with us for a long time. I'm loyal to them. I said, but dad, they don't treat people appropriately. They're not great managers. They don't create a great environment. Maybe they're affecting our ability to get other people in the business that can make a difference. He's like, yeah, but this is what we've done. It just like, it, it um, I learned a ton from my dad, but there were just opportunities I thought to do a better job on the people side of things. So. For me, the human system component of the metronomics framework is, I, I think, the most important. And if you can get that right, I think everything else gets a lot easier. So I'm really, I'm super passionate about it. And I, I was reading through some of your previous articles, and there's a great quote in one of them that I'll that I'll read out. Great leaders make consistently hard people decisions, which sums up exactly what you have just said. Yeah, great leaders, they make those decisions. They don't necessarily like making those decisions, but they make those decisions nonetheless. They do. And it's, and it's hard. You know, it's, it's, um, I ran into this. I ran into this in our family business. I ran into it with every client I work with today where, you know, I, I have, uh, I hire people in our organization. It's interesting what I see happening is this kind of flip. I heard somebody do a job, whatever that job is, whether it's soup on the floor or you're running sales or you're, you know, you're, you're running the manufacturing floor, whatever it is. I heard somebody do a job and then I, I develop a personal relationship with them and something happens where the relationship conflates itself 
And then that personal relationship often becomes more important than what I heard you to do. And I just think that uh, as a coach, we have to be thoughtful to remind our, 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 our CEOs, our owners, and their teams that um, it's great to have great people that you're loyal to and you love working with them, but you know, we, we, they, they got to produce value. They have to deliver value. They have to be able to fit the culture. And um, we just have to constantly get better at, at making sure that we're doing those things all the time. So, so for me, the human, and, and it looks like we've started on the human system. So let's keep on, let's keep on going down, down that path. Yeah. So for me, the human system is 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 all about you know scorecards. It's about the function chart. It's about the key function flow map. So it's about that. It's about combining, hiring, retaining. Uh, you know, making sure that we have the best people in the business, but also putting the right frameworks around them so that they can do their best work. Now, how, how would you explain the human system? You know, someone said, well, okay, what is, what is this system? There's seven systems in metronomics. What, what is the human system? How would you explain it? Yeah, I think, I think it's all those things. I think for me, it's really kind of figuring out who's doing what in the organization. You know, I like to talk about Jim Collins a lot in the human system. For me, it's really how do we get the right people on the bus and how do we get them right seat on the bus? And I think that that human system um, Understanding the analysis of it, I think it's never done. I think it's the, the you know the key function flow map or the, excuse me the key functions, which we outline when we work with a client for the first day. For me, that's the beginning of organizational design, and I just don't think in small and mid-sized businesses they're doing really good organizational design. They're not thinking about those things. And one of the things that happens for me, and this is really fundamental, kind of my belief system as a coach, is that I don't think that people are often clear what's expected of them. And I was lucky enough to work at the Gallup organization as a, as a consultant, oh, golly, 15 years ago. You know, Gallup, um, one of the things that they do is lots of work in employee engagement. And you know, they ask 12 questions at every, every company that they work with. The first question, I think it's the first or second question they ask every client they work with is, do you know what is expected of you? Um, and what I find is when I go in and they meet with a new team for the first time and I go ask the, the leadership team to tell me what's expected of you or the question we would ask at Gallup is, um, what do you do to get a paycheck? So, you know, when you get that paycheck at the end of the week or every two weeks, you know, what are the things that you do? What are the two or three things that you do that generate that paycheck? And oftentimes what I find is that people don't know that. And so as leaders, as coaches, I think we have to go help our, our leadership teams um, really figure that out and, and really start to have those conversations. Um, and that for me is the foundation of everything we do in the human system is making sure that we're creating clarity and what's expected of me asking those questions. And then that becomes a framework for me for future organizational design. So as the business grows, I'm asking that question and I ask this of, I ask this of every client in the last quarter is, you know, what are things that you're doing right now that you shouldn't be doing? That for me becomes the next kind of step in thinking about um, kind of the key functions that we look at and what's the next thing that maybe a CEO is doing they shouldn't do. So somebody else in the organization do that? Should that replace, you know, what they're doing currently? And how do we think about that constantly? Um, I think that's super important. And so um, I, I think, you know, at the beginning of our work and, and I think, you know, I have some clients that have been working for five years. We're constantly talking about that. I mean, they're just never done talking about do you have the right people doing the right things with clarity look like for them in the role? What outcomes are they supposed to generate as a part of their role? Do they know exactly what that looks like and do they, do they know how they're going to get to that? Um, so for me, that's the, that's kind of the, the foundational part of uh, the beginning of what I think the human system is all about. And you would you would think that clarity of expectations should be pretty straightforward. I mean, surely surely people know what they're supposed to do Monday morning and Tuesday morning and the rest of the way through the week, but they often don't. And you know, I, I find exactly the same. I go into an organization and when it and when it comes to start building out the scorecards, you know, they they look at me with puzzlement and it's like, no, well, we do lots of things. Yeah, okay, but what are the three to five things that are most important? Oh, but they're all important. Okay, but what are the really, really, really important things? And the, the, the fact that no one has had this conversation with them, you know, the fact that their manager or their leader hasn't had the conversation with them and that they haven't asked their leader or their manager about these things, it, it's, it's always surprising. But it is so normal that it's true. It's true. So if that's what, if that's what happens in most organizations, if we can go in and we can give them 
help them get instant clarity on expectations, both first at a, at a leadership level and then a management level and then at a supervisory level and all the way down. Now, this makes a huge impact on the business. And it's potentially, going to the, back to the point you made earlier on, it can be very, very quickly become a differentiator because people know what's expected of them. Yeah, it's it's the for me it's the most important thing, and you know I use a lot of sports analogies as a coach, um, because I think uh, coaching sports and coaching teams in a sporting world and our business world I think they're really similar. I know Shannon feels the same way. She talks about a lot, and uh, when we meet and the things that we do, and you know um, I've had the opportunity to do a bunch of uh, coaching of sports uh, of teams uh, in the last oh ten or ten or fifteen years, and and. You know, I really learned a lot. This is really interesting. I really learned a lot about being a better business leader, a better business coach by coaching youth sports. Because they started to realize is that we had all these ideas of things that we want to do as a coaching staff that we want to put in place. And when we went to, we went to practice every day, we had a bunch of 8, 9, 10, 11 year old kids that were, um, you know, we had all these visions of grandeur, what we we're going to do. We get to practice, and, you know, these kids don't know the first thing about what they're doing. They don't know how to put their, they coach football, American football. And, and it was coaching, you know, nine and 10 or 11 and 12 year olds. And, you know, we, we show up at practice and they never put a helmet on before. They don't know how to put their pads on. They don't get in a three point stance and they don't know any of the fundamentals of the game. And they just didn't know what was a, you know, we had to build that. And then we put plays in, in, in place. And what we found was that we had all these elaborate plays. We had this big playbook that we wanted to put in place. And what we realized really quickly as a coaching staff was that our kids couldn't execute that. They needed to be really clear about what were they needed to do within their role on the team, whatever their position was. And we had his coaching staff had to make that really clear. And we had to drill that over and over and over again so that they got comfortable with what was expected of them and their position. And when we called the play, whatever the play was, that they know exactly what to do when that play was being called. And so that became the foundation of what we did as a coaching staff is get really good about making sure that those kids were really clear around what, what was their responsibility in a certain play at every position. And I gotta tell you, it's the same thing in run business today. Uh, it's exactly the same thing. And, and we as coaches have to help help our, you know, the, the the teams that we work with to get better at this and and to constantly be looking at are we making sure we're putting our people in a position to be successful. And and the the whole business sports coaching analogy, you know, stands up most of the time. And I think one of the differences, and I think you mentioned this in one of your articles, is that sports coaching is often pretty much real time. You know, whereas coaching your team is often not real time. There's often a delay. Uh, and one of the challenges there is how do you reduce that delay to, to as, as short as possible so that you can get the coaching to the right person at the right time with the minimum delay? And in business, that's not always possible. And I guess there's a big distinction between American sports and sports in, in many other parts of the world in that in America, coaching is pretty much instant. You know, you're pausing the game every few minutes. Uh, you know, that doesn't happen in uh, rugby union. It doesn't happen in sort of an you know, AFL. Uh, so you've, you've probably worked out how to do it better in sports than the rest of the world have. Well, I don't know about that. I just, I just think that um, if you can provide feedback as close to when something happens, um, the better. It's funny. I, I had a, a meeting this morning with the CEO and we were doing some planning for a session we have in a couple of weeks and we were doing analysis of this whole team. So we were going through and evaluating the makeup of his leadership team and how well did they fit the core values and how well are they were performing. And, you know, we talked about kind of what their gaps were in performance. Everybody has them. We all do. I have them, you have them and everybody on their team has them. And, you know, one of the things that the CEO said is said, you know, when I see these issues, I don't tell them about them all the time. And I'm like, well, how do we change behavior if we don't, like, if I see this kind of thing happening with people and I don't provide them that feedback in the moment or as close to as I can, how do we change behavior? So then that becomes the norm. So coaching is really being thoughtful around if I see stuff that's going on, whatever that is, I have to be able to interject and be real, provide feedback on, hey, here's, here's how this came across. I don't know if, you, I don't know if when, you said this, that this is the impact that you want to make. This is the tone that you want to deliver it with. But here's how somebody felt about that. So you got to be able to coach them and provide that feedback. And, you know, I had this conversation with one of my CEOs yesterday who was struggling with feedback with one of their team members. And it's described to me exactly how they had the conversation. I said, wow. I said, the way that felt is that you were having a conversation with me, looking at me down the barrel of a gun. 
you were on the same side of the table with me. It was, you didn't like their, you didn't like their answer or you're frustrated with a work product if they were doing whatever it was. And it was adversarial kind of coaching. It wasn't, Hey, let's talk about what we're trying to get done here and how can we solve for this problem? And there are things that I can do to help provide resource to you to make that happen. Right? So we're probably talking a little about the coaching system right here, but yeah, that, that coaching is really important, but we're getting back to the human system that that has to happen all the time so when people have to be clear again going back to the scallop stuff people have to be really clear what's what what's expected of them and as a leader we have to create that clarity for them and one of the things i tell teams is that if your leader's not doing that you got to go ask now hopefully they are but don't sit there at your desk and toil and be doing something you think that your boss really wants you to do without going and asking the question Say, hey, what are the things that you really value for, uh, for me to deliver or to get done in my role? What are those things or what metrics are important for you in my role? Because, you know, that, that, that's out there. There's a lot of leaders that aren't creating that clarity. They should be, but oftentimes they're not. If you're an individual contributor, you got to ask those questions because it's about making an impact. It's about um, you know, making sure that we're clear on, the, on, on what we need to do every day. Yeah, absolutely. I worked with a CEO. This is a couple of years ago now, and and the CEO confided in me that he was he was starting to lose trust in his COO, now, and I could see from the CEO that he was puzzled as to why this was happening. It wasn't really something that he understood. Uh, so you know, he was feeling that you know there's maybe some something wrong with the communication between them, um, and and I just asked him. So you know. Uh, have you spoken to to him about this? Now, how does he know what your expectations are? And the answer was, well, shouldn't he know? And and it's like a, the, the assumption that people know what is going through your head. You know, you're not happy. Surely they should know that. Well, no, they don't. They don't. If you're not super clear with people, you know, super clear in a nice way, of course, but super clear with people, then you can't expect them to understand what you're thinking, what's going through your head. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and, and I don't think that providing that clarity, I don't, I don't think it's punitive. I think it's the conversation is my job as a leader is to help you be successful in your role. Because the way that I get judged as a leader by the results of the team that reports to me, whether I'm the CEO and it's my leadership team, I'm a functional leader and so people report to me, the way that you know I, I get validated in my role is what impact is my, is my team making. So I think the conversation that's important is you know, my job as a leader of whatever is to help you perform and be successful in your role. Here's the things that I really need from you in your role and to make sure you create that clarity so they know what it is um, and get really clear around. It can't be more than five, right? Because it's more than five. They can't execute that effectively. And I've run into that where they have 10, they have 10 different things they have to do. And I'm like, well, you know, that that's hard. How do you execute 10 things really well? So get it, get it to five, less than five is even better if you can. But that, 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 you know, you can't, I just think that you have to spend a lot of time on that. And, and I think that the changes, it changes frequently too. As the business grows and changes, that stuff you should be looking at every quarter or every, every six months at least to make sure that you, you're setting people up to be successful. Are these the five or so things that you would put on a scorecard in, in a top grading scorecard type of approach. Yeah, abs absolutely. So what, you know, what are the five things that you spend your time on and then what's a metric or an outcome that we use to demonstrate the performance of that, right? So if you're the director of sales and VP of sales, it's to grow a, you know, a high performing sales team with X amount of A players, whatever that is, 80% of the team hits their, it's their quota, right? So there's numbers that we're tying. So this is what you spend your time doing. For me, there's priority to what's most important, least important in those five things. So um, number one to five is the order of the priority. And interestingly, what I've, what I've run into some of my clients is the thing that's number one may take only 10% of my time, but it's the single most important thing. And what's the outcome, the metric that we want to see from that? Yeah, it's super important. And, and making sure that um, you're, you're, you're you know, taking the time to figure that out. And sometimes it's hard, you know, these, sometimes we have organizations that haven't done any of this before and maybe don't have the data because they don't have some of the technology systems in place to be able to measure and give us some of that information back. Um, but I, I think we have to constantly be progressing it and starting to put these scorecards and these frameworks in place 
um, so that we can validate um, kind of role by role, function by function. This is what success looks like in a role. And so somebody knows what they're trying to do. You know, they, they have a map really of what success looks like in a role. I, I think that's really important work. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Do, do you use top grading in its full form or do you use a, a modified form of top grading? I use, I would say, um, you know, a, a lot of that in an iterative form of top grading that I started using um, actually before I started coaching. So um, we, we use something that we use to create an, what we call an accountability matrix, which is very similar to, to what we see from, you know, Brad Smart and Jeff Smart. Um, so I would say it's really close to that. The tenants of it are really close. Um, it's just something that um, I've been using for a long time and really comfortable with it. So, John, right at the beginning of this uh, this podcast, you you mentioned that people can be a strategic differentiator. Let's let's drill into that. Tell me more about uh, your thinking there. Yeah, I mean, I just I, I really think it is, and you know, one of the things that I see in a lot of the clients I work with, um, you know, I work with clients from you know twenty million to three hundred million dollars in revenue, and a, and a lot of older companies, you know, companies that are you know forty, fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty years old, so they've been around for a while. Um, what I find though, and, and across, you know, my clients and then even just, you know, in the business community is, you know, everybody's biggest concern is they don't have enough of the right people. And so they can't get the things done they need to get done. And, you know, one of the things that I'm really focused on with my clients right now is actually starting to get strategic HR in place. And I think I have that done with almost every client today where they're starting to make investments in not just HR from a, hey, a payroll and benefits perspective, kind of stuff that is table six, you gotta do that right. But really, how do you start to invest in strategic HR that can really drive talent acquisition um, and help drive a consistent process, a discipline process around talent acquisition? Because what I see happening with most of my clients is that they want to be able to add people, but there's really no formulaic approach to how they do that. So they kind of wait till I have a need for a project manager or Java developer or a salesperson or whatever it is, and, and then they have to go out and start the recruiting process. So there's they, they have to get better at really building these internal recruiting systems so that they're always out looking for talent and they're building talent by role type so that they're, they're constantly evaluating talent, they're interviewing all the time and really starting to realize that uh, looking at talent acquisition, spending time to constantly looking at, um, you know, people that are, could be a fit for our organization and not just reactively recruiting active candidates, but maybe passive candidates that, you know, would be really excited about this kind of opportunity, but maybe the timing doesn't line up that can only become a true strategic differentiator. So really focused with my clients and really starting to build out that capability and really focusing on, you know, making sure that we're constantly looking for talent all the time so that when we have a need or we have to make a change, I don't have to start from scratch. And that we actually put those metrics in place for HR so HR can start to manage and understand what are the metrics that HR should be judged on, time to fill, quality of hire, retention, uh, how that ties to business performance, all that kind of stuff. So for me, talking about the human system, that's a big part of the human system also. Um, and we, we have to do a better job. Almost all my clients have to do a better job of making sure that we've got enough raw material, right? From a people perspective, like one of the things I see happening is clients want to hire whatever the role is again. And because they're not really spending time, um, building up this capability, they're making a selection out of three people they interview for a role and they're selecting oftentimes just the best of the worst versus somebody that's an A talent that fits your culture. It's going to be able to perform. They're, they're kind of making a hedge on something. It's not really a great fit for them. And so for me, it's human system stuff too, that, that they have to get better at that. And as coaches, we have to help them understand what that looks like and why they need to do those things. What does that actually look like the day to day? Are, are you working closely with a head of people? Are, are, you know, are you sort of, you know, coaching them on how to go about doing it? Because that this this can take a, a hell of a amount, of, a, a lot of time. This can take a lot of time in the business, and it, you know, and it's you know, it, it's got to be a number one priority, or else they're not going to give it that time. Yeah. So I'm not actually going in developing a recruiting strategy for them. It's really making sure that they're putting the right resources in place, and then what are the things that those leaders, in, from an HR perspective, should really be responsible for. Um, so one of those is really how do we actually build a recruiting strategy as a part of their scorecard, and what does that really look like? 
and everybody on the leadership team has vision into that. So everybody can say, hey, if I'm running this division or that division and I need resources, what can I expect? Like, what is our internal service level agreement between which HR is delivering to the rest of the functions? Because what you hear a lot is, I can't get things done I need to get done because I don't have enough of the right people. Well, we have to solve for that problem. We can't just say, we're not achieving our goals because we have enough of the right people. It goes back to my comment about my dad years ago. We got to find the right people and we can do that, but we have to, we have to spend the time to build a capability, internal capability to be different. And it's funny, you go in small and mid-sized businesses, um, there, there's an opportunity to just be different by being really, really good at talent acquisition, be really, really good at performance management, really, really good at coaching, which helps to lead to consistent culture. I think you can help compete by just being good at that stuff. Yeah, I, I've noticed there's a flip normally in around end of the first year, the beginning of the second year, when when companies suddenly start to find it a lot easier to find really, really great talent. Now, and they, they don't necessarily, you know, add one on one together and then make three. But, you know, what, what's happening behind the scenes is, you know, their culture is improving. You know, their outward reputation is improving. You know, their employees are telling everyone about this wonderful company they're working with. So it's starting to attract really good candidates. You know, people are saying, ah, oh, something special is happening over there. I, I want to I want to be part of that. I want to be I want to be part of that. And it almost happens overnight. All of a sudden they're getting lots of really good quality candidates, whereas before they were getting lots of really poor quality candidates. You know, and this this polarization, this, you know, attract repel type of mechanism of a really good you know, understood known culture in an organization makes it makes a massive difference. But they often don't see that inflection point. Have you have you seen that? Yeah, I do. I, I see the same thing and I, and I and I feel that too. And I agree with you. I said it, it's almost like um you're starting to push through. it's always like they're pushing a rock uphill until they start to get the stuff in place. And for me, and, and I know you feel the same way too, it's like, I gotta get the right leadership team in place doing these things. And strategic HR for me is just really, really important because there's just, who's gonna do it? Like all this people stuff, if I don't have so many of this, a strategic HR leader in place is doing this, it just doesn't get done good enough. And so we don't solve the problem. We're just always dealing with the wrong people issues because I don't have the right people in HR. Again, strategic HR, they're driving this stuff. And so I'm always pushing around the pill. Until I start, to, when I start to get this in place, you get one or two key people, then three people, because HR is really starting to deliver value. And the rest of the team's like, oh my God, we've never had this many good candidates. Like this hasn't happened in our history. Like we had seven people we interviewed and like, we want to hire five of them. Like, well, let's make sure that it right was. But like, this becomes a revelation for them. And, and you start to see, it's like the rock starts going downhill. And I hit old boss that was a really successful guy. And he said, if you feel like you're spending all your time pushing rock uphill versus downhill, something's wrong. And I just think on the people side of this, which again, the human system for me is the foundation of everything we do. If I get, if I get really good about getting people that fit our culture, that want to perform, that, that, that are aligned with who we are as an organization, we have to work on that. We, we'll just win. It's all about people and getting right leadership in place that can manage and coach those people. And I, and I think uh, in the world at the moment, there's a limiting belief that it's really hard to find good people. Uh, and and I'm not sure what it's like in the U.S. Uh, you know, we we have uh, increasing employment. People are uh, uh, sorry, increasing unemployment, not massively, uh, but people are still saying you can't find good candidates. Uh, and the reality is, they can't attract good candidates because the good candidates are out there. They just can't attract them. That's exactly right. Yeah, it's you know, it's um, they're just not doing the things that they need to do. They're not they're not driving this repetitive process for going out and talking to candidates over and over again and building these pipelines of talent that can help them really overcome this issue. So I'm just waiting, I'm posting on, the, on my website, I'm putting something on LinkedIn, but you know, and that's, that's okay. I mean, it's table stakes, you, you have to do that, but what are we doing to really drive a different people strategy? How, how are we doing those things and who's accountable for making that happen? And how many candidates should we be interviewing you're just really driving this consistent process. So you got to build that foundation. And, and I think that there's just real opportunities to differentiate and, and grow because you're just really good at finding the right people. And this isn't just the responsibility of HR or people and culture. This is all of the leaders in the business getting super clear on the expectations they want of the key roles in their business. You know, and that talks to scorecards. It talks to, talks to function accountability. It talks to the key function flow map. 
Uh, so it's not, it shouldn't be seen as just a, an HR issue. It is an issue for the whole company and the whole leadership team and the whole company need to work together to address this. And if they don't, they're not going to end up with a strategic recruitment system that is going to bring in those A player to a top quality, top caliber people. Yeah. And, you know, going back to kind of question around the top grading stuff, like, like one of the big things that, that I'm huge on right now is, is discipline. And you know, as we talked about kind of before we started, is like discipline almost has this negative connotation today. But discipline, which for me is repetition of doing things, whether that's our meeting structures, it's um, it's it's you know our recruiting process, it's the interview process. Like that discipline is what sets us free. And oftentimes it may not be sexy. And we're going to skip steps. And what I find is that when you skip steps. You make mistakes. You hire the wrong person. You bring on the wrong client, right? Whatever it is, discipline is really important. If we can just get the right people in place, being disciplined about putting our process in place, I talk about is kind of putting our franchise models in place. So we've got a consistent process for how we execute all that stuff. I think it's essential. I think it's super important. So discipline around talent acquisition. Um, I, I think it's it's really important to build that framework, that foundation in your business today. John, that's great. That's great insight. Uh, maybe now is a good time to, to switch uh, switch tack and start talking through uh, the Coach Cascade system. So seven systems in metronomics, you know, the, the Coach Cascade system is what I call the elusive system because you don't really start working on it until year two. Uh, and it, it's one of the really powerful, it's one of the really powerful parts of metronomics because most leaders probably see themselves as managers and they certainly don't see themselves as coaches. So there's a lot of power here, uh, but it takes a while to really start turning that on. Now, t tell me about how you've implemented the Coach Cascade system. Now, what does it look like for you? Yeah, I would say that's pretty similar. Again, I, I have some clients that you know, are further ahead than others with Coach, Coach Cascade. I, I agree there's a progression to it. It's pretty foreign in a lot of organizations when you think about Coach Cascade and for me, Again, going back to the discipline thing, there's a structure and discipline to how we coach. Um, again, for me, going back to talent acquisition a little bit, is that if I'm hiring leaders or managers, I want to ensure that they know the coaching under people on a regular basis is one of the fundamental things that I expect of them in their role. So I want to make sure that when I'm hiring people, they know that we're a coaching organization, we're becoming a coaching organization, and that that's one of the things that we're going to be required to do. And, you know, I, I think that's important to create that foundation. I think it starts at the top of the organization, starts at the CEO level. The CEO has to start to be able to coach their people effectively. Regular rhythms, we're sitting down with them, you know, for like a half an hour, hour, hopefully every week, if not every couple of weeks. But there's a, a discipline or structure of how they do that. Um, we're lucky enough that, you know, we work with a metronome software tool that, that I implement with all my clients and they start to put all those one-on-one -on -one rhythms in, in, uh, you know, in place so that, um, we can obviously drive that discipline that, you know, every Tuesday at nine o'clock, I'm sitting down with my CFO. Here's the metrics that they're responsible for. Some of those will be daily metrics. Some of those will be weekly. Some of those will be monthly, whatever they are. Um, here's the priorities that they, we've agreed on that they have to, you know, they have to deliver on what's getting in the way of those kind of things. What actions do we, are, are we undertaking or to move the business forward? Right. So I just love that that you know through the through the the Coach Cascade system and and the Metronome software that we really build that rhythm that discipline in place that we can start to have these conversations with people. And you know, it's interesting when I start to work with clients. Sometimes I don't put a formal structure on that. Sometimes what I'll do because it's so foreign for a lot of people, I say, okay, just like you start having a half hour phone conversation with somebody every couple of weeks, just start checking in with them because a lot of places they haven't thought of before. And coaching is intimidating. I don't, you know, I, it's, it's, it's overwhelming. I think for people, maybe it's intimidating for them to want to coach somebody. So I'm like, let's just start having some regular conversations with people. Like, Hey, what's going on in your role? What are those things that are, are becoming, you know, are, are, are getting in the way of you being able to, to perform well? What, what's, what's driving it crazy? Yeah. What are those things? So we just get, start to get some cadence. I have a client I've been working with for a couple of years. They have a new leader in place, and that's just kind of the framework we're working on right now. So let's just start to have some conversation with the people who report to you um, on a regular basis. So every couple of weeks, we're sitting down, we're having a half-hour conversation. Let's just start building that bridge to get them more formal coaching where we can use more of the scorecard stuff because sometimes that's a little bit overwhelming. 
um, with an organization that's never a scorecard in place in 50 years. So, you know, try to meet organizations where they're at and evolve that. Um, but for me, that regular interaction with people, what I find and, and what I found was when I was a leader of, of, of teams is that my A players really wanted coaching. They really wanted to know what the gaps were. What can I do to be better at what I do? You know, what are the things that I'm not doing that I need to do? And so that coaching, I, I, those A players really love it. And I think what you find uh, is that sometimes, oftentimes your C players may not want all that coaching because they lack accountability. They don't want to really be accountable. I'd like to get that paycheck for whatever you're paying me and not be really accountable to deliver whatever value you've deemed that I need to deliver. That becomes obvious. That, that then becomes, going back to the U.S. system, Right, they're the right people because they really want coaching. Like I, I you know, I, I, I always enjoyed that when I had leaders that would, that would say to me, "Hey, here's something you got to do different." Or, you know, we had this presentation and you talk too fast, which I, I can do at times. Yeah, slow down. Like here's the, you know, here's here's what you need to do differently. Um, it provides feedback to people really consistently. So, Coach Cascade for me is is something I'm really passionate about. Um, and you know, really passionate about trying to build that out on my clients so that they can, you know, provide that feedback and environment for people to be successful in the roles. Within Metronomics, there's a few sort of you know techniques that we use around the Coach Cascade system. You know, just around you know over over time, pushing questions back and you know asking them, you know, what do you recommend? You know, trying trying to coach your direct reports into not coming to you for answers, but coming up with answers themselves. Now, and maybe checking those answers with you, but um, but at least you know, coming up with a with a with a solution, coming up with a position, and I think that that, that really shifts the dynamics in in an organisation because you know you you end up moving from a sort of you know a team of yes people to a team of you know well why don't we people, you know, and I, I intend to, and this is um you know this is you know, going back to you know turn your ship around the you know the I can't actually know um, David Marquette you know who who came up with that book turn your ship around you yeah. know that that incredible concept of you know actually empowering people to make their own decisions but still communicating what those decisions are yeah you know i love it you know for, that's really about delegation right delegation is one of the most important leadership skills to get good at and um you know i, I look back on my career and there's still like golly i could have been a lot better delegator um but it's interesting like one of the things i realized about this is who teaches you about delegation you go to you know you, you go to school you grow up in a business environment and who's the one that really formally teaches you about the, the why delegation is so important and how do you do it effectively? So nobody. So it, you, you can't scale a business and you can't grow a business. You can't grow a team if you can't delegate effectively. And like one of the things they're talking about is what do you recommend is like, you know, people oftentimes what happens in these, in these, in, in the, a lot of business that I've worked with is that there's this upper delegation of decision-making because I haven't created a safe environment and I haven't delegated effectively as a leader and say, what do you recommend? Or, or, you know, somebody comes in and asks a question and, and my response would be, I don't know, what do you think? Right. They should be coming up with solutions and, and, you know, coming in and saying, Hey, I got a couple of different ideas of how to solve this problem. I'd love to get your perspective. And as a leader, you should still be asking a bunch of questions, not giving them the answer so they can get it and they build confidence in it. And that upper delegation thing, it's funny, when I do a little bit speaking, when I speak, it's like, this is happening in every business every day where people are coming in and they're upper delegating decision-making to you. One, because you haven't given them the power, maybe you haven't created safe for them to do what the parameters are around what, what they can do and not do within the role. But every time you do that, it's limiting your ability to be successful as an organization. The other thing that happens a lot is and this goes back to coaching is that you have issues, right? In every business, there's going to be issues that pop up. A fire, you know, some 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 big issue with a client pops up, or uh, some Amazon manufacturing, whatever it is, and I as a leader go solve a problem, but I don't take my person that's really responsible for that, or somebody that maybe is going to fill that role in the future and make them a part of seeing how I facilitate the conversation with the client, right? So for me, one of the things that I talk about is. I want to make a positive out of negative. In every negative situation, I have to take a step back. I have to collect myself. I have to understand kind of where we're at. And then what is my resolution I want to try to get out of this thing? And I want to bring my other people into that. So maybe it's one person when that happens. That, but, but they see how I facilitate that process. They learn. 
And every time I do that, you're building organizational capability. And it's just funny that this goes on in every business every day where we're not being thoughtful about, is this an opportunity to develop somebody? One, by either delegating or, or two, by making them a part of how do we do problem resolution effectively and make them part of like that deductive reasoning, that critical thinking that I go through to solve a problem, right? That for me is all part of coaching too. I'm bringing it into that. Yep, yep. And, and I'd, there's a technique I often use when someone comes to you with three possible solutions and you know, and you, know, you want them to make the decision because it's about their development, not about you know you making decisions for them. You know, and uh, asking the question, you know, when they say, "Well, you know, I don't know which one is the best best option," and say, "Well, if you did know which one was the best option, which one would it be?" And without thinking about it, they say, "Oh, it's option number two. Okay, there you go, option number two. <laughs> yeah. So they do know, they just don't want to make the decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they may be afraid, or you know, there's there's a lot of that, right? How do you? And I'm sure I did that as a leader a lot, where I'm not creating a safe enough environment where they can say number two, and you know, that's 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 around self awareness as a leader that I have to understand. I'm not creating a safe environment for people to really move ahead in their own development, take ownership of stuff because things got to be done my way, right? And that's another part of this delegation thing that we're talking about is that you know, how do I get this a, 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 the same result or better result? But maybe, but go through a different process. There's a different method to that, right? And that's part of growth, I think, as a leader and self awareness, also. So, so, John, are you are you leaning on any particular books around uh, the Coach Cascade system? Are, are you using Speed of Trust or Scaling Leadership? Or I use a bunch of different stuff that I've kind of um, uh, I don't say amalgamated, but stuff that I've kind of pulled together. They use as a framework. I use stuff that comes from the metronomics community. Um, in, in, in putting some structure on how do we coach, I, I love all, I love all those books. You know, one of the things that, um, I think is really important today, and I've actually pushed back from, from CEOs about this is that I think that we have to really understand, um, why people can work for our organization. So if I'm, if they work for me, I have to understand why they're working for our organization. And, you know, my, my premise is that. If somebody wins a lottery or they inherit a bunch of money, they're probably not coming to work tomorrow. Now, maybe they are, right, because they love their work, they love the culture, the whatever. But a lot of people aren't coming to work tomorrow. So they're coming to work for a reason, right? And the more that I know about why somebody comes to work for my organization and maybe me, right, Gelp's, Gelp's data on in the States out there for a long time is that people – We've leaders, they don't leave organizations, right? Um, but if I really, if I really understand why they come work for our organization, why they come work for me, what they're trying to get out of their time of work or whatever that is, you know, I'm, I'm coming here to get a paycheck. I'm putting, trying to put a roof over my head. I'm trying to put my kids through college. I am, uh, you know, trying to travel the world, Wh whatever, trying to retire in 10, whatever it is. I have to know that. Because one of the things that happens, right? And I had this happen to me when I was a young guy and they had a, a leader put his personal agenda ahead of my agenda. And, um, I'll never forget it. I was 25 or 26 years old. And, um, the things that were important to him were, were as we went through how he could pay as a salesperson. Um, he put, if I, if I sold this, this software project that we had that, you know, he made his quarterly number. And I was, I knew that we wouldn't be able to deliver the capability that, that, um, that the client really required. And it's, I can't do this deal. It's a bad deal. Cause I knew I'd get charged back as a salesperson. My boss was super upset because he wasn't getting his, his number for the year. And they get it. He wasn't going to make his money, but he didn't really care about me in that instance. He cared about himself and he put his personal agenda in front of what was best for me as a young sales guy, tr tr trying to figure it all out and trying to do the right thing for the organization and operate with integrity. And it just stuck with me for a long time. And I just think that if we want to be effective coaches, I got to know why people come to work for me. I have to know what they're trying to do. And the more that I can help them achieve their personal goals, again, whatever those are, the more I know about that. When I say, hey, here's the things that work that you need to do, and I'm helping you achieve the things that you want to personally, they're going to run through glass for you. But you got to take the time to get to know your people. And you get that's coaching. So when I provide when I provide that feedback to them around, hey, you know what, you're supposed to make, I don't know, ten sales calls today. You made two. 
How does that help you achieve your personal goal? You're probably not doing the things you need to to be successful. Is that really an important goal or not? Right? So for me, it's about this kind of intimacy. I think if you look at um, the workforce today, um, purpose-driven work is huge. Right? There's this, there's this just connectivity between if I can connect what people do every day to our purpose and organization that resonates with them and they can see the impact they're making, that's phenomenal. I think we also have to connect why they come to work for us and what the things you're trying to do. We're a vehicle for them to get the things that they want to get. And as a coach, as a leader, um, I have to know, I have to help them achieve those things. And so, um, yeah, I use a lot of different stuff from a lot of different people, um, to help them do that. And it's actually one of my favorite books is the dream manager. If you've read that book at all, but it's a, it's a fascinating book around how do we help people achieve goals that they didn't think they could, they haven't thought about it and uh, don't have dreams. And when I develop dreams, I start to achieve those, how it changes people's lives, which that's where I think why we coach. And hopefully our, our, the clients that we work with, they want to change people's lives too. Um, that's what it's all about. Okay, I think that probably brings us to the end of our time today. So there's some great insights uh, in the conversation today. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to going back over this and taking some notes because I've, I've learned some stuff today. So that's awesome. And, you know, uh, we're all learners and uh, I'm never happier than when I'm than when I'm learning. I, I, I want to before we wrap up, I just want to go back to um, a quote in one of your articles um, that, um, that you you uh, you posted a while ago. And this is a, a Jim Collins quote, and uh, we, we all love Jim Collins. Uh, and this really, really relates to the first part of the session today around uh, around the human system and you know, attracting and hiring and retaining the, the right people. Uh, and the quote reads, the moment you feel the need to tightly manage someone, you've made a hiring mistake. Great quote from Jim Collins, and it is pretty brutal, but it is very, very true. Very, very true. It's funny. I, I, don't, I read... Um... Frank Slootman, who was the former the CEO of uh, Gallywood what company is that? I can't remember right now. He wrote a great book too. I'll, I'll text you or I'll email it to you. One of the things that he said is, if there is a doubt, there is no doubt about people. And I got to tell you, it's really true. Everybody that you kind of like, and you, and you have this, like one of the things that was funny, one of, the, one of my friends is a really successful CEO. He's like, what I see in leaders is they have this hope strategy, you know, like, oh, I hope they're going to be successful versus, all right, am I coaching them to be successful? Do they have the skills, the capability, they fit the culture, do they want to do what we need to do to fit the culture? Let's kind of put them through that process and make sure that they can, they can do what we need them to do. And if not, it's interesting one of the things that he said, and I really, I like this, and I, I talked to other my CEOs about it, is that I know my organization is working correctly. When I go on way on vacation, I come back in a week and people that, that aren't part of an organization anymore. So they've made hard decisions to remove people that don't fit the culture. They're not getting the results. That goes back to scorecards, hitting clear metrics, having the, the core values alignment, all the stuff that we work on all the time. Um, he, he was a big fan of that. And, and he knew his organization was working right and his leaders were making those decisions. It wasn't him saying, hey, what about Susie? She's 60% of her numbers. And she, she doesn't show up for work on time, all that, all that kind of stuff. So that, that was a big thing for him. And it's important to remember, it's not always about them. You know, sometimes the company is not right for the person. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not we're right, they're right. It is sometimes, you know, one side or the other, or both sometimes. Well, you can have somebody, I had this happen to me. People work for me at one company and I brought them into a different company and they just didn't fit. They were A players there. They came to this organization, they weren't A players. Now, I don't know what happened. Life, you know, life affects yeah. everybody. Different Maybe culture. their personal circumstance changes. Yeah, different culture. Mm -hmm. Or they didn't have the work ethic they had before. Or uh, they were, you know, whatever. They couldn't do what we needed to do. I had that happen to me. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't, it doesn't always play. As I say to people now, like I've had this with a couple of clients where they've hired people because they were referred by somebody internally and they, they skipped the discipline hiring process. And like, this isn't a good fit. I said, it just doesn't translate all the time. I wish it did. It'd be easy if Susie was referred by Joe would come in and work the same way she did with Joe previously, but you still got to put him to the rigorous discipline process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Tip Top is brought to you by Metronomics. To find out more about Metronomics and how this 20 plus year old proven system will save you time and money as you grow up your business, visit metronomics.com. That is 
M-E-T-R-O-N-O-M-I-C-S dot com. Also search for Metronomics in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and anywhere else the great podcasts are found.